We have a uh, special treat for you this morning. Uh, we're privileged to have Mark Buchanan here as our guest speaker. And Mark is uh, relatively new to the Ambrose uh, community, and he's uh, teaching pastoral studies and practical theology there. And uh, you may recognize uh, Mark. He's written uh, several books. Uh, the Rest of God is probably one of my favorites. And uh, so I'm just happy to introduce to you Mark Buchanan. Mark, come on up, and why don't we welcome Mark this morning to bring this guy's word. on we're on good hello I think my wife's here too Cheryl are you here oh hi <laughs> it's my wife <laughs> I noticed Jason didn't show up that's that's ominous eh? <laughs> I've known Jason for a long time really what a privilege to I was a pastor for 24 years and uh, not only to hand over your pulpit but then to leave it completely to my designs, I mean, that's a, a tremendous display of trust. I want to tell you what the best news is. I think if you went anywhere in the world, talked in any culture, man, woman, boy, girl, old, young, African, Latin American, European, North American, Asian, and you said, what is the best news? I think the answer would be that the worst news isn't the last word. The worst news isn't the last word. In fact, the Bible has a word for that when the, when the worst news isn't the last word. And the word is never the less. <laughs> You're dying. Never the less. <laughs> you are a slave. Never the less. You're guilty. <laughs> you got blood on your hands. You've been caught red handed. Never the less. It is utterly hopeless. Say it with me. <laughs> Never the less. Well, back August 5th, 2010, a drama began to unfold that captured the hearts of the entire world. It was in Chile. And 2,500 rather feet under the surface of the earth, three kilometers away from the nearest opening, an explosion way down in the bowels of the earth, 30 miners were trapped. Diminishing food, diminishing water, diminishing light, diminishing hope. Uh, one month went by and they were still there. Two months and they were still there. 69 days into their plight when it was getting utterly desperate, a great light broke through. <laughs> and the whole world cheered the resurrection. Remember? <laughs> Nevertheless, would you hear the word of the Lord for this morning? It's from Isaiah's gospel. <laughs> Some have called Isaiah the fifth gospel. And this is what Isaiah says in chapter nine, beginning in verse one. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the shadow of the shadow of death or the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders. 
the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, established and upholding it with justice and righteousness, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. And if we're good Anglicans, we'd say thanks be to God. I'm a good Baptist, but, but just why don't we say it and indulge me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Isaiah's nevertheless. Darkness, gloom. I'm gonna read in a moment a a little bit of the further description just before in chapter eight of how bleak it was for the people. And and what caused the plight of Israel? Well, Well, there's really two things that he talks about in chapter eight. What's causing the darkness, what's causing the distress, what's causing in one translation the anguish for these people is us and them. Us and them. Assyria would be the them. Assyria was the great menace coming out of the north, cruel people, bloodthirsty people, rapacious, coming and devastating land after land, city after city. Assyria was coming. They were being loosed. (laughs) One commentator calls Assyria, says that they made the Nazis look like choir boys. A fierce enemy is causing the darkness. And there's a fiercer enemy than the Assyrians, in case you haven't heard (laughs) that makes the Assyrians look like choir boys. And he's the bringer of darkness and he's the father of lies and he wants to lock you up forever in the dungeon. So them, the enemy. And and then the other cause of the distress is us. Um, In chapter eight, Isaiah talks about our rejection of the river of life that would flow to us. And then in in verses 19 and through to 22 of chapter eight of Isaiah, he describes how people in distress, people who are in darkness will go to anywhere but God to try to find hope and light. And it never works. In fact, they curse the God for the for the situation there, but they look everywhere for the hope and can't find it. This is the description that Isaiah has in chapter eight. Men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, but should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living, to the law and to the testimony? If they do not speak according to the word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged And looking upward, they will curse their king and their God. They'll blame God (laughs) for their own folly. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. It is a bleak picture, us and them. (laughs) But then the next word is the beginning of chapter nine, nevertheless. Do Do you rejoice? Would you rejoice with me today? That whether it is us or them, whether it is the enemy that oppresses, whether it's no fault of ours, whether somehow we fell into uh, these unfortunate circumstances, but it's bleak and it's dark and it's hopeless, or it's us that did it. (laughs) Just a series of bad decisions. Whether it's us or them doesn't matter to God. His his, his announcement over the whole thing is nevertheless. (laughs) Nevertheless. I am breaking in to the situation, (laughs) that when you look at it, there's no home. I'm breaking into the situation and I am defying 
the situation and I am subverting the situation and I am banishing the situation and I'm bringing something that you could never create, never manufacture. In fact, it's got to the point where you can't even imagine. Nevertheless, (laughs) and he describes it as a great light breaking in. He describes it as great joy and he says that It will be like victors celebrating over the victory. And then he points to one of the great nevertheless moments in the life of Israel, the story of Gideon. I'm not gonna get into that, but Gideon was this least likely to succeed person who God raises up, strips down his army to 300, takes all the weapons away from them, gives them little pots, little flashlights, and little horns, and sends them out against 135,000 Midianites with guns and grenades and tanks and camels, all that. And uh, it's, the odds are impossible. Un- the Midianites have been plaguing Israel for seven long years and plundering everything they have. <laughs> And God says to Gideon, you just go with those 300 and go sort of walk around and toot your little horns, doo, 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 and say something, and, and then pull, you know, put your flashlights under the little pot, and then pull the pot out and flash the light and, and freak them out. And you're like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> and you know the story, the original 300. <laughs> they completely defeat this vile, oppressive enemy. The zeal of the Lord has accomplished this. And, and the rejoicing, can you imagine? So Israel's thinking, yeah, what is it like when this light breaks in, when this joy comes? It's like that day when Gideon, against all odds, <laughs> defeated the greatest oppressor we faced in our day. There's a turning point in this story um, commentators who look at this text say that the whole thing actually builds on this f- pairing of phrases in verse one of chapter nine, in the past and in the future. <laughs> in the past it went bad, in the past it was bleak, in the past it was hopeless, but in the future light, in the future hope, in the future resurrection. Uh, we know historically that probably the very first horizon of fulfillment for this passage in uh, Isaiah 9 was actually the birth of a king, Hezekiah. His father was an idiot, Ahaz, a man who had completely turned to paganism, and Hezekiah came to the throne at a young age, and he destroyed all the high places, he destroyed all the pagan altars, and he restored the worship of the one true God. And so uh, the people who are hearing this would first think Hezekiah, but clearly Isaiah has in view something bigger than that. (laughs) You don't call just an earthly king, an ordinary king, mighty God. (laughs) You don't talk about his kingship going on forever and ever. Clearly he has something in mind beyond just this earthly king. And of course, so then the church has understood this rightfully so as a reference to In the past, you didn't have Jesus. (laughs) But in the future, (laughs) a child, child. But there's a personal horizon of fulfillment for this passage. It's about your past and your future. You don't know me, I don't know you, I I know Jason. I've met a few people in the church, but we're, we're strangers to one another. So I don't know why you're here if you come here every Sunday. I don't know if you bowed the knee to Jesus when you were three, five, 12, 20, or if you never have. Maybe your mother-in-law dragged you here. In every man and woman and child's life, there is a possibility, a great potential for a divine nevertheless. Every life has a possibility of hinging on a in the past and in the future. 
In the past, it was dying all the day long, it was slavery, it was guilt, it was darkness and doom and gloom, an enemy oppressing. But in the future, a great light is done. And today, if you've never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, if you've never said yes to the the light that has come, (laughs) why would you continue to carry the yoke of the oppressor on you when God is offering you his divine nevertheless? Well, this light breaks in, this nevertheless happens, this great joy, And all of this because of a child. That's um, a child. (laughs) Did you see that coming? (laughs) I mean, nobody saw Gideon with 300 guys. Gideon, this little coward, like I can't do it, I'm small, I'm nobody, all of that stuff. Nobody saw Gideon with 300, not a weapon on, I'm taking out 135,000 Midianites. But did you see that the great answer divine nevertheless to the Assyrian problem and every other enemy since was a child. (laughs) Let me tell you how this always works. God's answer to your worst problem is always a surprise. Always a surprise. You don't see it coming. You couldn't have cooked it up in a million years. <laughs> you know, really think about the, the first Christmas. You, you think about the, the power uh, that rules the land is Augustus, the great Caesar. And he makes a decree, it's arbitrary. He just says, um, everybody go and be uh, enrolled for taxation purposes. And so this poor little teenage girl tottering under the weight of her pregnancy now has to be uprooted from her home in Nazareth and she has to go uh, staggering, you know, riding a little donkey down to Bethlehem, the whole t- kerfuffle, all, the, all the, the crush of people moving down there. She gets to the hotel, there's no motels, there's uh, no vacancies, they, uh, out in the garage, they have to, she has a baby. Augustus couldn't care, Augustus didn't notice. <laughs> The only reason we know all those names now, Augustus and Quirinius of Syria, Syria, is their footnotes to the baby, the child. The the answer to your greatest problem is always a surprise and it's always personal. Unto us, a child is born and to us a son is given. It's always personal, it's always his prize. And he will be called, he's no ordinary child, and I've got to about seven minutes to <laughs> talk about what they asked me to come and talk about today. There's these beautiful names that this child will be called. Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. I want to talk to you briefly about Everlasting Father. But I wanted you to note that he will be called these. There's a difference between being named something and being called something. Um, My name is Mark. I got introduced as Mark. My wife calls me, well I won't go there. The point I simply want to make is we call people that name that emerges out of intimate relationship. It's how we know the person. That's what we call the person. We, we know them as sweetheart, we know them as pookie or whatever. What we call someone always emerges out of intimate relationship. Do you see the good news all through this text that he will be called? You know what it's saying? It's not just his names, it means this. You are going to experience this child to you, unto you, born to you, 
given to you. What a surprise. <laughs> How personal. As you, as you enter into the relationship with this child, you are going to begin to have names for him that you will call him out of the depths of the intimacy of the encounter. You're gonna call him wonderful counselor. I've never had a counselor like this. You're gonna call him mighty God, which means he fights for me. <laughs> He's the warrior God, he fights for me. Sir, you know what you're gonna call him? Prince of Peace. He didn't know where this shalom was gonna come from, but he, the prince came and gave it to you. And you're gonna call him <laughs> Everlasting Father. The dad who never goes away. <laughs> In fact, the, the, the church fathers, uh, their, their favorite way of translating Everlasting Father is the father of the world to come. But that, I mean, as, as bright as those guys were, it, it kind of falls short. Because the word for everlasting in this text not only means eternal, it has two primary meanings. It means eternal or everlasting. It also means ancient, ancient of days. Here's, I think, the better way to translate this, this term everlasting father. The father of the world without end. Now, when we hear father, uh, probably around the room, a whole range of emotions are being evoked. Jesus said, um, which of you fathers, though you are evil, he, he just designates us all bad. <laughs> though you are evil, which of you does, does not know how to give good gifts to his children? Who, if your child asked for bread, would give him a stone? Who, if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? Who, if he asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? Jesus says that even though earthly fathers often get it wrong or sometimes get it wrong, they at least know how to give good gifts to their children. He doesn't say we always do. And so some around the room, you think about your dad, and you think, every time I asked for bread, I got bread, and every time I asked for fish, I got a fish, and every time I asked for an egg, I got an egg. It was, it was awesome. And some of you are thinking, but sometimes, maybe most times, I asked for bread, and I got a stone. I asked for fish, and he handed me a snake. I just wanted an egg, and he handed me a scorpion. Just always these angry words, this cold silence, this clips upside the head. I... <clears throat> Everlasting Father, for some of you, it's not necessarily the most comforting thought, the dad who never goes away. I think in order to really get hold of this, we have to jump into the New Testament because there's just a few scattered references throughout the Old Testament to God as Father. And actually, this is the one in Isaiah that gets the closest to being profoundly personal. But when we get into the New Testament, we find out that Jesus has a, a favorite way of referring to God. Abba, Father, Dad. <laughs> And he invites us into that relationship. And then if, in case we didn't understand what he meant by it, he tells us a number of father stories, and of course the most famous is in Luke 15. There's a father and he had two sons. <laughs> and one of them asked not for bread or egg or fish, he asked for the inheritance, and the father never, knowing he was gonna be an idiot with it, didn't hold back. <laughs> His father just gives. And then the, the son goes off to the far country and the father loves his son and he longs for his son and he thinks, but he just waits. Because he knows as if he goes and rescues the boy and pulls him out that he just waits for the light to dawn. <laughs> and then one day the light dawns and the boy comes to his senses and he says, there's gotta be food. There's gotta be bread to spare in father's house. And he, and he makes his his sorry little way home with this dumb little speech in his head that he's not worthy and he'll just be a servant and all of these things. And he's coming and the father sees him a long way off and the father throws down everything and hitches up his long robes and he begins to run. (laughs) 
And the son makes this funny little speech about, Father, just, I don't want servants. I want sons and daughters. Quick, 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 fire up the barbecue. And the party begins. But he had two sons. And one of them had never left home. He'd, he'd been in church all the time. <laughs> Grew up in church, grew up in Sunday school, never missed. Even when he was sick, he'd come, he'd just sit in the back and put a handkerchief over his mouth, trying not to share the germs. Just a good kid. But he was far from the father, too. <laughs> and he hears the party going on for this rascal that's come home, and he, he's not coming in. And so this father who gives and this father who waits and this father who runs goes out to that son and he says, son, everything I have is yours. (laughs) I've never withheld from you. And this isn't gonna be a real party until you come in. (laughs) I, I know you've taught Sunday school for 38 years, and the only time they notice is the time you missed. I know this is something you've poured out your life for, and nobody seems to notice and care anymore. I know. I'm sorry, but everything I have is yours. It's always been that way. And I'm not even going to go in the party until you come, so come on, son. (laughs) Jesus tells a story about a father like that that welcomes all the prodigals home and welcomes all the older brothers in. And he says, that's the father we get forever. And one last thing to close is I think Isaiah poses and answers the question, how does the father do all this? How does the father break through into the darkness with a nevertheless? How does the father the father with world without end uh, open his storehouse and say, come on in. <laughs> well, in verse four of chapter nine, there's uh, this description of the oppressor and that his rod, his oppression is on our shoulders. And then in verse six, it says that the government of this child who we will call these things, the government will be on his shoulders. The the church father, Tertullian, says, what king bears the insignia of his kingship on his shoulders? Kings bear it on their head as a crown. They bear it in their hand as a scepter. They bear it in what they sit on, the throne. What king bears the insignia of his authority, his government on his shoulders? The king described in Isaiah 53 that our punishment was laid on his shoulders. And because our punishment was laid on his shoulders, the zeal of the Lord, the passion of God, has accomplished all of this. That no matter how far you are from God, the everlasting Father says, you're welcome home. And no matter how religious you've been, but estranged from the Father's heart. The Father comes out and says, we won't really be able to celebrate until you join too. Don't you want to run into the arms of that Father, the Father of world without end? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that the surprise of the way you solve the worst problems is 
we didn't see it coming. A child, we thought you'd send a warrior, we thought you'd send money. A child, in the littleness, in the vulnerability, is the answer to all that ails us. And God is so personal to us, given to us. And so God, we, uh, I pray today that if any, anyone is here and they are the prodigal, that they would know that the Father's house is open, his arms are wide, there's food to spare, there's bread abundant, in their welcome home. And I pray if, if anyone here has been dutiful for years and years and years, but they, it hasn't been intimate, it hasn't been close, there's a resentment, there's a frustration, I pray that they would hear the Father saying, we can't really celebrate until you come in. It's not gonna be a party. And God, for all the rest, I pray that we would just hear the Father welcoming us, saying over each of us what you said over the Son, Jesus Christ. This is my son, this is my daughter, whom I love. With them I'm well pleased. And so Father, as we take this meal now in celebration of, and remembrance and anticipation of the one who took the government on his shoulders so that we could all come home. I pray that we would come to this table as though we were coming to the very Father's house. And I pray it in your name, amen.